I hope you're all well. I hope you're all thriving. And today we have my special guest, Tanisha Peoples. Hey, Tanisha. Hey, hey. How you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Um, you know, maintaining during tough times. You know, that's all we can do. And so that's why I say we have to manage moment by moment, day by day. Um, this is a new norm for us. And, you know, we just got to take it one step at a day. Uh, Oh, Christina, I can't hear you. Um, <clears throat> because we can't figure out what's going to happen tomorrow, but we could definitely manage through today, right? Right. It's, it's, so tell the people who you are um, and what you do. <laughs> you know, I, I just ramble, you know, so when it comes to talking about who I am, um, First, you know, obviously I'm a, I'm a black woman. Um, I'm from the South Side of Chicago, Inglewood, born and raised. Currently live in West Yep, Chicago, Chi-Town representing. Um, currently live on the far South Side of Chicago um, in a community similar to where I grew up. Um, and yeah, I'm a, I'm a hardcore activist. You know, I'm, I ride for my people, I die for my people. Um, I've been doing this work for a number of years. I'm currently the um, deputy director of activist development with an organization called Bright Bean. And um, yeah, I'm just all about the, the activist life and the education life, the liberation of our black and brown kids. So, you know, um, everything that comes under that umbrella, that's me. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I met you um, on the, in the trenches on yeah. the picket line at the Black Parent Strike in Sacramento. We was yeah. out there like, uh, we are not backing down. Um, and I, we we actually met a few times in uh, Sacramento on in the trenches on the picket line, uh, mm -hmm. fight for, you know, school choice, Black Parents Strike for school choice. Um, and so, you know, it's real. Like people see the word activist and they wonder like, what does that mean? You know, and so instead of me trying to give them the what, I give them my why, you know? And so, you know, it's all about generations, the future. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. Challenging the systemic oppression and institutionalized, ra institutionalized racism that they have to um, live under. Um, yeah. And making sure that we push for systemic change, you know, because you can see, Surface level is just talk, right? Yeah, absolutely. People talk around stuff and about stuff, but we talking about real change that's felt. Yeah. The impact of that. And yeah. so talk about your journey and your why. So the interesting thing is, is I never had a, I never had a plan, right? So again, I grew up in Inglewood. The majority of my family graduated from high school. Um, if they didn't graduate from high school, they may have gotten a GED, they may have dropped out, you know, but the philosophy was, you know, get whatever education you can get and just get a job and keep that job until you can retire. Um, so I had the, the, the fortune of being able to go to good schools outside of my community. Again, Inglewood is a low income, predominantly black community. So you know what that comes with. That comes right. with trash schools, that comes with trash elected officials, you know, that comes with blight. It comes with it, well, it's without a lot of stuff. And so I was able to test into um, those magnet schools and, you know, be exposed to a lot of different things, a lot of different cultures, a lot of different people, um, more experiences that I, that I saw, um, that, I, that I saw growing up. And so from there, I got the, um, the motivation to go to college. And so I went to undergrad, I went to grad school, and I knew that I had a passion for working with kids and uplifting kids, but I didn't really know where I should take that passion. And so naturally, right. I went into um, the nonprofit sector and I started out on the social services side. And I, I enjoyed the work, it was draining, but it wasn't fulfilling, you know, mm -hmm. it wasn't completely fulfilling. And so I think the one thing, the why, and all activists have the why, we're, 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 we're propelled by some kind of self-motivating factor. And right. I, was a, I was managing an after-school program in Evanston, which is a city um, a couple of miles away from Chicago. 
And uh, while I was at work, someone broke into our building, right? Mm. And so mm. I drove home. It was about a 45 minute drive home. And um, I just had the thought like, damn, you know, like, I, you know, first of all, I feel threatened. I don't feel safe. I don't want to live like this, you know, right. where somebody's breaking into our houses while we go to work and stealing our stuff, our, you know, the stuff that we worked hard for. And I'm just like, this ain't, this ain't living, you know? Mm -hmm. and so I think that's where it clicked, where I got the idea that I have to still work with kids, but I have to empower them to be something greater than what the world has told them they should be or what they can be. And mm -hmm. I need to work to change the trajectory of our communities because if we keep going like this, it's, it's ultimately going to be self-destruction. And right. it, won't be, it won't be a great quality of life. It won't be anything that, you know, we can enjoy and anything that we can work for if we're in such a, a destitute position. You know, and so I transitioned from the social work side to the advocacy side. And in transitioning to that side, I got into educational advocacy. And I. Tanisha. OK, so we're going to um, wait a little bit. I'm sure that everybody understands that we're having uh, technical difficulties. That's just during the day. Um, no matter where you at, <laughs> I experienced them. And so anyway, you know, just talking about managing your day and um, being mindful and thoughtful of not trying to figure out what's going to come of tomorrow, um, not even making predictions, you know, just taking it one step at a time. Um, I do want to let you guys know that, you know, when... I am watching. Sometimes I don't have the ability to um, answer questions and comments. And so what I do <clears throat> is go back into the thread um, to answer those questions and comments. So anytime you leave them, just know that I am going to be going back or you can always reach out to me on Facebook. Um, you can always, you know, email me at Christina at npunion.org because I'm always willing to answer questions uh, and just take those comments to heart you know i'm accessible um everybody that i work alongside of with uh, national parents union is accessible and so while we wait and see if um tanisha's gonna come back up i want to hear from you guys um i want to know how you're doing right when we first um began this COVID 19 stay at stay at home um blah, school closures, you know, people were having high anxiety, um, very frustrated, very overwhelmed, not knowing what that was going to entail, not knowing what that was going to look like. And so now that we are made it this far, you need to be celebrating that, that you have made it this far, right? And so don't worry about what's to come or when things are going to take place. Be happy that you made it this far. You're doing it. You're managing each day um, and allow your kids to celebrate those small um, victories, right? What are the small victories in your house um, that have taken place? Okay, so I have a question from Bernita and it says, tell us about advocacy and how parents use what they're feeling to advocate yes we're definitely going to address that i think we got tanisha back <laughs> hey sister <laughs> i am you know what that has never happened i am disappointed in my internet i gotta get expandy on the line and just you know go in that has never happened let me tell you something on managing day to day it happens all the time <laughs> i was on the road too and i'm just like what happened you uh. good yeah, and so go ahead and um, and then we got a, a comment. It says, "Tell us about Bernita." Uh, shout out to Detroit. Um, hey, Bernita. Tell, <laughs> tell us about advocacy and how parents use what they are feeling to advocate. So you know, 
definitely from my experiences, um, I saw things that were just out of line, right? Um, I have worked in public education for 13 years. Six of that was spent in early childhood education. Seven of that was spent in special education. So I knew intimately, I understood the system. I understood what I was seeing. And, you know, when my kids started going to school in, a, in different places, I saw these huge issues. And I saw that they were no, there was no accountability and they were not being addressed appropriately. And even if I spoke up loud for my kids, they would fix it for them. But I noticed that there were other parents and other children that were still struggling through the system, right? Um, and so that became a huge problem to me because I could yell all day. I could write people up, uh, send letters to Office of Civil Rights and all of that stuff. But what about the other children? Um, you know, and then too, I saw the pattern that it would be resolved shortly. And then the next year, I would have the same issue again. I'll be thinking, why am I still fighting this battle, right? Like my son, diabetic. I had to fight for his meal accommodations at school and for him to be able to have a snack at 10 o'clock and for him to be able to, to self-regulate and say, I'm not feeling well or I'm feeling lethargic or I'm feeling tired. And so when I saw the level of, of fight that I had to give, I was like, you know what? The everyday parent is not going to be able to um, understand what this looks like. And I am going to put my foot to the pavement and help as many people as I can. So that's my answer to that um, in a very brief statement. We can talk about this all day. <laughs> so go ahead and take off where you left off, Tanisha. Um, where did I leave off? <laughs> you were talking about um, how you, you know, working in social services, it oh, wasn't yeah. so yeah. Okay. Because I don't know where Xfinity started acting a fool. But yeah, so I, okay. long story short, because I know we on a, a limited amount of time, I, was, I wasn't fulfilled on the social services side. I felt like social services were enabling our people to stay complacent, you know, right. and limiting their ability to, to advocate for themselves. Because it's like, if we put a Band-Aid on these issues and make it seem like we're giving the resources and, you know, the supports that these communities need, then we keep them blinded to the fact that they deserve so much more. And so right. that was that was part of the motivation for me switching over to the advocacy side because it's like, no, we go, we go release these crutches, we go snatch these band-aids off and we go expose the truth, you know, through exactly. empowerment. And so having real conversations, really um, equipping parents with the skills to do the research and the facts about what's really going on so that ultimately they will be pissed off enough. And that's what it takes to be an activist. Like you are pissed off so that mm -hmm. they will be pissed off enough to say enough is enough. Like we're about to get, we about to advocate for ourselves and get what we need. And so that's what it's, it's, I wouldn't, I don't know if it's negative to say it's an adrenaline rush, but it's something that I thoroughly enjoy because it's moving us one step closer to that freedom that everybody else is guaranteed. Exactly. And we deserve that we haven't we haven't gotten. So um, and it's been difficult because I don't have kids, you know, and so people, some people I've gotten questions like, well, well, not necessarily questions, but there have been undertones and conversations in which I felt that people questioned my commitment because I didn't have kids. And it's like, don't I, I hate when people question my my commitment and my experience because you don't know me. You don't know where right. I grew up. Some people may know where I grew up, but you don't know what I've gone through what I've seen, how I see my people struggle. And I don't need to have kids for all the kids in my community to belong to me, which they do. And if we all adopt that mentality, whether the child is biologically ours or, you know, whatever, if we all adopt the mentality that all of these kids belong to us, then we will be motivated to advocate for them. So all of these kids are mine, all of them. You know, that's I'm not saying I can't pay for all of them, but I, they <laughs> belong to me. <laughs> I can't pay for all of them. I can't pay for them. It's okay though, because you you there's different types of wealth, right? And so we're not talking about financial wealth. We're talking about the wealth that you bring it back to the children that are in the community. And I will have to say that uh, when we say all, we mean it, right? Right. When other people right. say all, they don't mean it. That's just a term that's loosely thrown around. Like, oh, we talking about all kids? Really? Are you? Because I know a no. whole bunch of them that you're not talking about. 
That's that. Um, that's that all lives matter mentality that people want to take on when they need allies. But when it's about their kids, it's like, no, our kids matter. Yours don't really matter. So that's you know, and we we've had those conversations too, Christina, where we've yeah. been confronted by you know those all lives matter activists. But when it's time to stand up for black and brown kids, you know, it's crickets. No, no, right. <laughs> no, not at all. And that's why I got to the point where you know those people was coming so much for us like i was like just be quiet while grown folks talking because i can't <laughs> you know go somewhere because we are talking about what is happening um they like to talk around us about us but not mm -hmm. directly to us and mm -hmm. so if you say all then the burden of proof is on you prove it okay right Right. Data don't prove it. Our experiences don't prove it. Even if you talk to the kids and the parents, you can't prove it there. Um, and so the burden of proof back on you, prove it, right? Exactly. Um, which is not going to happen. And so I like the fact that, you know, you said, I don't have kids, but my heart is in this. You know, yeah. uh, and I would call that adrenaline, what you call adrenaline, zealousness, right? Your passion, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. And so I know that feeling, like, even when I try to say, there's been days, I got to let y'all know, America, there's been days where I'm like, forget it. I'm not, I'm just not even going to do yeah. nothing. And I'll get three phone calls and it's like, okay, I was just playing, you know? And so... <laughs> Those days happen. So how do you manage through the time that's rough when people are saying to you, um, you don't have kids, why you care about the kids so much? Why are you fighting so hard? Why are you doing this? What is your strategy that may be able to help other people keep being unrelenting? I mean, you know, the, the, the mantra that I've taken on recently is, if not me, then who? You know? Right. And so again, all of these kids belong to me. They belong to all of us. Mm -hmm. And so I... I've just become more unapologetic in my advocacy, you know, in, in really understanding white supremacy culture and white supremacy constructs and um, oppression and lacking self-worth, you know, um, and how that has been really embedded in us to keep us in a place of subserviency and, you know, in a place of oppression and post-traumatic slave syndrome, all those things. And so really, really trying to unlearn all of that to empower and uplift my people helps me block out the noise, you right. know, and, and, and really focus on the work that I was called to do, the work that I'm passionate about, and the work that I'm going to die doing. You know, it's, it has been, there have been many times throughout my, my career or throughout my life where I want to quit, you know, because it's not easy work. And that's why, um, you know, it's like when we have people that claim to be activists, but they really not about this life, you know, it's like, prove it, you know, and you're not willing to, you're not willing to risk it all for what needs to be done, then you're not a real activist, you know? And so there have been times where it's just like, man, you do the stress that I'm under, the, um, the criticism that I'm under is not worth it. But you can't ignore that, that passion in your heart and that drive mm -hmm. in your spirit to, again, liberate our community. So you can't leave it. It's like a relationship. You can't leave it. You know, right. like we married. And so you keep going in it because it's what we have to do if we want to see our communities better. Because, again, we deserve better. And yeah. if we're not doing that work, then who's going to do it? And not to say that there aren't other people out there doing the work and that, pe that ultimately, as a people, we don't want better. But there has to be somebody driving that work and mm -hmm. leading that charge because, again, we've been told since we landed on these shores that we can't and right. that we, we're not deserving. So right. we have to be the chain breakers, you right. know, we right. have to be the chain breakers. And so I, I appreciate that about you. Um, you know, you speak in my language, right? <laughs> All the time. We've <laughs> had <laughs> conversations forever. You know, one thing that you taught me, right, over the time of, um, from the time I met you to now, is that activists can take a break. Yes. Because I remember you asking, Christina, do you really do 24-7, like, what? 24-7, 
<laughs> 368 days because you done added your own days to the year. I just got my own calendar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Christina, rest. <laughs> like, you can rest. It's okay. And, and I was like, how can you like, and you was like, that's some office hours. I was like, what? You know, that was a foreign thing to me. So I appreciate that part that you're really um, balanced and thoughtful and intentional in your approach. Um, mm -hmm. And then just even helping me be like, okay, I can actually lay down my javelin and my sword for a minute and just step back and refocus and rethink. Um, and so, you know, having a community of activists to lead the work is really helpful. Um, but I want you guys to understand as well that anybody can, you know, take this passionate desire and ability and push for change. Every generation should do better than the last, right? We're yes. talking about generational structural changes. Um, it don't take an expert. It just takes a person that's willing to be unrelenting and consistent. Um, and not back down and not give up. I always be like, I'm about to start a California Black Pair Wildfire. Don't get me started. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Love starting fires. Right. Love starting <laughs> fires. Love starting stuff. Yep. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I also see your passion come through your writing, you know, um, and, you know, tell people where they can find your articles at. So you guys can find me on the Education Post website. Um, that's educationpost.org. My column is called Hope and Outrage. And so it's, again, it, it was, it's what it takes to be empowered and, you know, empower people. So it takes hope for you to see that light at the end of the tunnel, to understand that your work is not in vain and that, you know, you can accomplish your goals. But it takes that outrage to, again, start that fire right. to where you have the passion to even fight. So that's why it's called Hope and Outrage. And I try to have real talk conversations, conversations that are relevant to our communities, conversations that aren't so wonky. I mean, to be honest, I don't care for data. I've never been a data am analyst. I've mm -hmm. never been a person that's just like, oh, what the numbers say, because I believe heavily in qualitative data. I believe right. heavily in the stories of our people and our experiences as qualified enough to you know, be considered substantive data. Mm -hmm. So those, those are the stories. I like to tell those stories. I like to talk about the things that people missed in my, that they missed in my Hope and Outrage column. And I hope that, um, you know, it inspires conversation, it inspires activism because we need it. You know, mm -hmm. like when you talked about self-care earlier, we are dying doing this work. I, you know, mm -hmm. sis in Oakland, I, her name escapes me, but she died doing this work with yeah. a heart condition and all, you know, um, and so that balance is important, but we also need people fighting with us because yes. we can't carry this load on our own. And so that's what I hope to do in my column is to inspire people to get involved and really understand the issues because education has always been put on the back burner mm -hmm. and we need to bring it to the forefront because that is the foundation that's going to determine our kids' failures or success. And, you know, you have a People's Voice podcast. Yep. <laughs> And so people can find that too. Where can they find that at? Is that attached to your um, Education Post uh, article? So that is not. If you guys want to follow me on Twitter at People's Choice 85, I believe that's my handle. <laughs> it's People something. <laughs> all people's, all E's, no O. So P E E P L E S. If you look it up and it's an avatar with me, you can't miss the dark skinned girl with the um, blonde fro. So follow me on Twitter and that's where you can find all of my. Um, my my platforms with hope and outrage and people's voice and just me talking crazy on the Twitter feeds. Um, my Facebook profile is also public. You know, I have no chill sometimes, so I keep it real. <laughs> Christina knows that. So make sure y'all follow me and engage with me so we can keep the party going and keep the movement going. And I be like, you good, Tanisha, don't even worry about it. You know, you good, you know. I have my right. um, level of drama and eccentric uh, stuff too that I know people be like, but I'll be like, oh, well, we just, you know, we like one big family, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and we need people to, like you said, get involved because we do need support. We take hits that people don't even understand or even know about. Um, and we're doing this for the children, for their mm -hmm. future, so that they can have a hope and a future, you know, exactly. and one that looked like our grandma 
and grandpa future. The past. Exactly. Right? Exactly. And so, you know, we want to see something shift. And even if we got to marshal a new era in, we're going to do that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm all, you know, we always down for a revolution. Always. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it requires a revolt to have a victory. And a lot of people, like, you know, stem, like want to steer away from the word revolution. But that is really um, a transformation, right? And so it's not a negative thing. Right, just like right. the word disruption. Um, really, if you're in the business world, disruption is a good term. Like you want to enter into the marketplace disruptively if you want your product or services to make it and thrive. Mm -hmm. And so we have to begin to shift our mentality and our thinking about certain things that we've been taught. I'll say that you know, colonized to believe um, yeah. and just see things for what they are and where we're headed. And speaking of where yeah. we're headed, before we close, um, uh, what do you, you know, what's your biggest takeaway from right now and being able to uh, move forward in your activism during this pandemic? <laughs> so I, I would say, honestly, like this pandemic is tough on all of us, you know, especially uh, black communities that have been hit the hardest, brown communities, and the impacts are going to be going to last way beyond the pandemic, you know, um, society. But what I've seen as a, as a silver, well, not necessarily a silver lining, but let's just say an opportunity is this is really a time if people weren't aware of the disparities before, we're seeing them now. And so for me, this isn't time to activate our communities around what we need. And so while people are thinking about um, tomorrow, I am actually thinking about months from now, years from now, when we have the opportunity to turn things around for our communities, and it's gonna take conversations, and it's gonna take education, and it's gonna take activism. And so I have been, I've had my hands in many pots and I'm right. having so many conversations around now is the time to reshape mm -hmm. our future and to reclaim our lives and to rebuild our community. And so that's why I am doing this pandemic. It hasn't been easy because again, I'm over here trying to survive myself. But um, you know, as activists, we we we're in gear 24/7. You know, so even when we're trying to sleep, we're thinking of ways to promote our communities and promote voices and you know uplift so this is the time this is the yeah. time while people are kind of being still and have the opportunity to listen this is the time to really put the word on the streets and you know sis, we want you to survive too so <laughs> you know uh I guess, God willing. you know and we don't we don't want to die from this work, but we probably going to die doing it, right? Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. and so I totally agree. I totally agree. You know, just having that um, understanding and that support system. I always got your back. I know you got mine. So I appreciate you coming uh, and sharing, you know, about your why. And if you have a final word for the people watching, uh, can you please go ahead and get that? Hey. That's what I got for the people watching. That's right. All right. <laughs> and you guys, that's my favorite dare shirt on. So y'all, yes. you know, look, we dare you to be bold and, yes. and be an activist, right? Yes. Uh, all of our children are worth it and they deserve it. And so I will see you guys. Thanks for coming, Tanisha. Thank, Thank you, you for so having much. me, sis. I'll see you again. Um, I will see you guys. Anytime, you know, that's what we do. And so you have been watching Managing Day to Day with Christina Laster, me, and National Parents Union. I hope you're all well. I hope you're all thriving. I will see you guys again tomorrow, same place, same time, on the National Parents Union uh, Facebook page live. Goodbye, America's beautiful children. We love you, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.